Manassas Foundation. Welcome to The Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis, L.A. and Dub Lab. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hi. Hello, could I please speak with Edwin Schlossberg? Yes, you're speaking to Edwin Schlossberg. Hello, this is Paul Holdengraber calling you from the Quarantine Tapes. I'm so delighted that you are able to take uh, our call. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how are, how are you living this moment of the quarantine? I'm living on Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. Do you know where that is? I, I, I happen to know where that is. Yes, that's where I'm living. And um, I've been here for almost, uh, I guess, two months, two and a half months. And has, uh, has the pandemic uh, struck uh, Martha's Vineyard? Um, well, there are about 15,000 people here, and there have been, I think, 13 cases. And so what do you do with your days? Well, I, um, I have a design company, which you may know that I am the principal of, and so okay. I'm, I'm on the phone uh, with them, uh, and I'm part of, uh, so, and I'm calling clients uh, and projects, uh, so I'm, I'm zooming around a lot, and, uh, and I'm uh, also seeing my friends, and I'm doing some drawing, and I'm reading lots of books. What and are you, what, I'm are you reading? what are you reading? Um, well, I was just reading a book by Paul Davis, um, uh, Davies, I should say, um, which is um, called The Demon in the Machine. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, really interesting about the um, role of consciousness in, um, um, uh, in kind of uh, the combination of how you, how you think about consciousness occurring in thought in the middle of thought rather than in uh, I mean what he's really interested in is that the way we we think of things as like the, 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 using the example he looks at he says you know there's there's stones and there's um, water and then there's air and then there's in this poetry and then there's the area that connects the two and so uh, he, he calls he's in, he's interested in that idea, consciousness as a, a thing that is the demon in the machine of our of our culture. How, it's really interesting. How interesting! I'll, I'll I'll have to look it up. It, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't surprise me, Edwin, that this would interest you. Uh, reading about <laughs> uh, about your life journey, I, I can imagine that 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 book was calling out to you for quite some time now. Uh, yeah, well, it's re relatively new. It's about a year old. Well, it's been calling out for one year now. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, you're on Martha's Vineyard, so rather rather protected. And this yes. this moment could, generally speaking, be affording us silence. But in, in some way, silence is, one would imagine, it would be something that would come to us easily. But given how connected we are, and you were just mentioning Zoom, and just about everybody I talk to is in one way or another connected to Zoom. I think I, I read somebody saying, cogito ergo Zoom. Uh, you know, this, this is, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we're all connected. As someone who knew John Cage, yes. what, what is silence and what happens in silence that cannot happen otherwise? So the interesting thing is, is that consciousness is in silence. So the, you know, the pause between words is the ones that give it the possibility of meaning. So right. I think John was always really interested in, 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 in silence, not as 
as if it was an interval, but sounds as it was a defining that um, a, a defining tool that allowed the separation between words, the moments between talking, the time you just re- reflecting. So the whole idea of it um, that that was as as much a part of a composition as the making of a sound. You know, I've 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 always been uh, quite attached to this one line of of John Cage which maybe you can help me unpack, where he says, the act of listening is in fact an act of composing. Yes, of course. Because you, there is the illusion that, you're, that the words are sort of drifting to you, and then they go in, and then they get processed like sausage. Right. But in fact, you're actually composing everything that you hear. Uh, you're, you're re- forming it and you're making associations all in real time. So the, the idea of, um, you know, really interesting, you know, the, sometimes uh, composers are so interested in the delay curve, you know, like you make a strike, a, a, a drum, and then you wait for the, the echo of it to come back and then you hit again. And I think that the, so that the intervals are always the ones that are the most, creative to compose because the sounds are r- relatively easy you know because you can make them right right um you know reading about your life story is really reading the story of extraordinary encounters and yeah. i think i think to some extent the extraordinary encounters are brought about by your desire to be surrounded by wise people um by people who can teach you something and from whom you you might be able to learn and one such person would be buckminster fuller and yeah. um i'm wondering if you could describe a little bit your encounter with him and your work on the World Game Workshop. And as you think about it now, what remains of that encounter? What remain? What are the lessons, in a way, uh, that still linger on for you at this moment, so many years later? Well, I met him when I was um, just, just getting out of college. And, and, and then actually sort of, just yes, yeah, I was just graduated from Columbia, and um, I met him. And the thing that was so interesting about him was, I don't know if you feel this way, but whenever I meet someone, I really, I sort of, I feel like I can see how big they are. <laughs> I don't know. I don't mean like no, you no, know, no. I understand. Time. I understand. Not but, how, <laughs> not how tall they are, but, right, but exactly. how, how capacious they are, and, right. and also maybe. Um, the the kind of expansiveness of their interests, right? And which I, I think is and really it, important. Yes, and so um, someone who, uh, when you listen to him, when I listened to him talk, when we were talking to each other, the thing that was so interesting is that he was selecting each word very purposefully in a way that you um, very often don't hear in people's conversation. He and he would, you know, kind of, if he didn't have a word, he would kind of squeeze two words together into a, you know, like, uh, you know, the word tensegrity that he made up and, and dimaxi and, and, and all kinds of, he always, he was always squeezing words together. And then, uh, because he, there was too, there, it wasn't enough in, in a word to, uh, in, uh, to express exactly the relationships between two things. And, you know, some people did that, do that with metaphor, but he didn't like that. I think he liked it. He was a little bit more literal in that, and so he would squeeze things together. And, and I, the, the idea that he, uh, almost on the, uh, probably the second time we met, he was talking about world game, and he said, you know, I think we're, we're in a moment in time, you know, when we're, we're about to see the Earth, not from its surface, but from the moon or from the stars, and you know, all of a sudden thinking that, you know, human beings had never seen the earth before. And he was thinking about that as the idea that allowed him to think about making a game where you could simulate how to optimize 
world resources to make it much more equitable between people. So it was an amazing um, way he thought. What what was that game? What what was the world game? Yeah. But it was never in his mind. It was um, let's build a map of the world the size of a football field, <sighs> and then we would have sort of a like a a big floating box over it, and then world leaders would be able to discuss how we could m move resources around so that everyone would have access to all the world's resources uh, relatively equitably. That's what his world game was. It sounds like we need the world game now. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing is that in 1969, we had a, um, uh, I went and, and, and raised some money and we uh, took over the, the work, the uh, studios at the uh, studio school in on Eighth Street and between Fifth and Sixth Avenue, and we had thirty uh, people that were work kids that we uh, that we got to. We wrote letters out to schools and stuff like that to say that we we're going to have a World Game program, and we got hundreds of uh, um, people who wanted to come. And then we chose thirty uh, people, and there was an astonishing group of people. And what we did was we built a, you know, a very large map that was like fifteen uh, feet uh, high, fifteen feet high, and about thirty feet wide. And then we had it was just uh, a clear plastic uh, sheets of it, and then we would chart where all the where all the Food was raised where the, all the co copper was coming from, when all the, and we got we got all this facts together so we could see where the, we would be able to optimize world resources. I mean, it's it's so it's so interesting, and I, I was not aware of it, and and I was also not aware of um, your book, which I I really want to read, uh, the in imaginary encounter uh, between Einstein and Beckett. Oh yeah, uh, and um, what did they what did they say to each other? <laughs> well, the, um, I, the like, book I, was, I like the fact that the question elicits a laugh. Yes. Well, they every one of the things that they said to each other was drawn from quotes that they had either written or spoken, and w b what I orchestrated their conversation to be about was about. Um, space, time, and mass, because both of them were very uh, interested in those three subjects. And so that's what we wrote. That's what I wrote. And I also did another bu book at the same time, which didn't get published, which was uh, Imaginary Letters and Diaries of Wallace Stevens and Niels Bohr. Goodness me. If, if, you, if you had to put together now two people in this kind of an imaginary dialogue or conversation, who might they be? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's really hard. Let, let's play the, um, let's play the game. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who do we need now? Well, we need, um, someone who has the, um, empathy and intelligence of Obama And maybe Paul Davis, who's, who's also quite brilliant. Um, uh, I, I, I have, that's a really hard question because uh, in a way, the sort of larger-than-life minds are, are, are very different now because, they, um, because the access to information is so huge that the... Um, The areas that people consider to be um, thoughtful are, are much smaller. Well, you see, we, we, we're going back to the initial moment in our conversation, which was one about silence. Yeah, and, and but I think it's a, the interesting it's thing is, yes, definitely. But the interesting thing to me is, you know, we have now somewhere between 7.6 billion people on Earth living at the same time, which is by far the farthest number, for the largest number. And at least half of them, maybe more, just went home and stayed there. And I'm stunned by that. I am completely, Why? utterly stunned. Why? Well, because it, because it was a, 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 because it, and what drove it was the fear of a very, uh, very powerful virus Obviously, what drove it was fear of death, but 
also the willingness to be um, a citizen of society uh, and do do what is asked of you. And um, if you, you know, I think that that's an absolutely remarkable, never before ever, ever happened event in the history of the world. And everywhere, I mean, and not everyone, and but maybe even more than four and a half billion or four billion or whatever the number is. I can't, I mean, I find that, Astonishing, and I think, of course, that the you know, digital communication tools have em- enabled that to happen. With any, um, I mean, I think without it, no one would have dared try to get to get to do that. But I think that it's an amazing moment in the world. Just a, such an amazing moment. And and would you qualify this amazing moment never before happened, according to what you just said, as? A positive outcome of technology reaching yes. people. You would, yes, yes. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's an amazingly difficult and especially stressful thing for people for whom um, the world was already narrow, that it got narrower. Um, but I think that the idea that uh, that everyone behaved well, relatively speaking, of course, some people didn't. Um, but the people who were behaving the worst were the leaders, not not the citizens. Um, so it's a, an amazing moment, just an amazing moment. I I I, I, I can feel I can feel um, your amazement at this moment, yeah. and and you know that brings me to your your interest in creating museums where there is a, yeah. a hands-on experience and now yeah. and now we we have this moment where right. teenagers and also college students but students generally speaking of all ages including kindergarten students who really don't know what to do or how to stay tranquil in front of a, a computer and the zoom call and i'm i'm wondering how uh, maybe you don't have a first hand experience of it but you have some experience given your own company how you think that form of conviviality at a distance will affect the way we take in information learn and the after effects of it when this pandemic does come if not to an end at least subside somewhat well i, I think that it will um, heighten the um, the opportunity of um, collective composition and collect, you know sort of um, large scale. Uh, you know, one of the things I was I would say as a second bounce on this idea about pe- people being at home that at any one time now in the world there are several billion people playing massive multiplayer games sometimes three and four billion people playing massive multiplayer games where they're playing with lots of other people. And I think that that's also a completely unconscious in most people's heads reality, um, not for the gamers, but for all the people who are not gamers. They don't realize that so many people are spending eight hours a day in a, in a, simulated world of and playing games with one another. And we have that for the last, I don't know, five years as this massive multiplayer games phenomena has arisen as being gigantic. It's been constantly surprising to me that most of the people that I come in contact with have no clue that that's actually going on. And it's the, the by far the biggest entertainment business on earth. <laughs> and so many other things. And I think that these kinds of um, the cl- collaborative collective activities, more, some more less physical than others, clearly, um, I mean, physical contact, are going to be the mainstay of consciousness because the, the, the challenges of the earth are uh, become so much more interesting and so much more better solved when lots of people are able to solve them collaboratively. So I think that's the thing to learn. But do people need to be 
in contact with each other the way you you perceived it earlier in your career where there's a real hands-on experience there's a yeah a, a commun- you know a communal effect where you're in a room not simulating uh, uh, right. uh contact and i i think particularly of your interest which i share very deeply for irving goffman and i remember yeah. in the presentation of self in everyday life he speaks yeah, about he speaks about this notion of staged authenticity and perhaps yeah. and perhaps the dangers of staged yeah. authenticity yeah i think that all these things have um, as with all, everything in life, you know, beautiful, hideous, gorgeous, amazing, <laughs> all the good different qualities. But I think that the, the challenges uh, of the, the most interesting thing in the world is the consciousness of, of people and what they see, hear, and do from the perspectives that they have composed. And so those stories and the, their, the, the, what they bring to a to a problem or what they bring to a, um, a you know a solution is just astonishing, and so the more that we get collaborative input and collective input, the the more we can solve these problems. I mean, you um, there have been really good stories about the uh, a couple of um, re, uh, um, uh, ma- um, companies that have focused on pandemics and, and their ability and how they tracked um, the virus itself and couldn't get anybody's attention <laughs> as they saw it moving around the world. So I think that um, all these all these tools that are much more metaphysical than physical are going to be very important, but the physical things become the, the, uh, the kind of the very special opportunities of uh, like nodes of excellence where people get together to uh, pool their um, at, pool what they understand and what they think is important about a specific subject. I, I remember uh, once being in a in a dialogue with uh, um, a man called Stuart Brown, who, oh, who Stuart Brown, yeah, St- Stuart yeah. Brown, who created the National Institute for Play, and oh yeah, and he believed very strongly <laughs> and had actually data about it that the rough and tumble play of, of children actually prevents uh, violent behavior and that yes, so exactly. ma- and that so many uh, really really dangerous uh, criminals one might say early on one um one fact of their life that was similar for all of them is that they hadn't learned how to really play right and and so this this virtual reality we're we're now confronted with all the more so with this pandemic might have aftershocks which we can't even quite measure yeah i think so i mean i think that i think that there will be such um uh, sort of excitement about going to see lots of other people and being able to test you know, we all go out and see other people and then we have, uh, you know, uh, so we have something to tell each one of them or hopefully that, that they find interesting or funny or whatever. And, uh, and that's what the, one of the things that is not as satisfying when you do it as serially as if you do it simultaneously. So, um, that's, uh, uh, that's an important, that's, that's why I think that, um, this, this, these last couple of months are going to be uh, a huge <laughs> um, moment in the history of the world because of, of the fact that people were separated out and then had to think about, the, you know, all the things that they were doing and that there were still at the same time, at least half the people who were separated out were, were actually playing games together in the millions. How do you think they might come back um uh, you know, in in other words, how it's a question I've been asking over the last six weeks that this this series has has been on the air is this notion of returning to to normal life. I think it just requires um, vaccine. Um, I think without that, it will oh, it will be awkward for a really long time. 
I, I wonder though if we want to go back to normal life or if this no no I don't I don't think there is normal life I think that's a, 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 a you know I think it's always been changing um, you know there's twenty two two hundred thousand people more uh, uh, there's two two hundred thousand more people alive are born every day in the world so. There, there's gigantics. <laughs> this is a, a, a huge, um, you know, humans are now the largest species on earth. And so the, um, these things are now, these are all adventures we're going to be going through. There, you know, we, we passed 8 billion people soon. Um, you know, I was, <laughs> ask, I was asking you what imaginary conversation you might want to you might want to write about a host, as it were, and that really brings brings about the your interest in the intersection between science and art, yeah. and the, yeah. and, the, and the dangers also when when there isn't really an intersection. And I'm, right. you know, I'm I'm really taken by one one comment that Robert Rauschenberg made to you, uh, where he said there have to be more interesting ways to grow than older. Yeah. And, yeah. and in closing, I'd love you to, to, to comment on that, uh, on that uh, sentence, what, what it might mean for you now well, when, I just when, think, when you yeah. look back. I think that he and, and many of these people that I was so lucky to meet with and be friendly with and work with and the, the thing about them was is that every day felt like an opportunity. That that it wasn't uh, it wasn't as if Bob thought that he had to forget everything. Right. It was just that it, it isn't the uh, you know it isn't the length of time you, you do something or how long you do it for or, or anything like that. It's um, growing in 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 a perspective, growing in your ability to confront things that you always were afraid of, and growing able to be a nicer to people or nicer to yourself growing, you know, all those things that you can grow. And so I think that that's, that was what he was a, a such a surprising person, you know, always um, to, to talk with him. It must have been, it must have been extraordinary. You know, um, a quotation I'll end this program with of, of John Cage which seems to me so important and kind of a lifelong journey to embark on. He said, uh, he said to use art not as self-expression, but as self-alteration. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. that's, you know, not, not just to say, what do I think, but how does it actually change me and change that my, my course, as it were. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, uh, the, such a, the, one of the threads of, of human life has always been this idea of we have to remember things so that we can teach everyone how, so that they can take care of themselves so that they, the skills aren't lost. You know, Diderot's encyclopedia when he, during the revolution, he made the encyclopedia because he was afraid that people would kill each other and they, no one would know how to make things anymore. Um, I think that, 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 uh, you know, I, I mentioned that to my son and he said, well, the internet's here. You don't have to worry about that because we've got so much of it stored here. <laughs> and that's both terrifying to me and incredibly, um, and, uh, it's optimistic, uh, that, that we can't lose, you know, in other words, the, the best um, painting, the best book, the best, there, there'll, there'll be thousands of them and thousands of places to, to work, push off from. In a world of, of eight or nine billion people, you need to be thinking about that. And the cultures can be so regenerative because they have so many different points of view that they can start from. And I think that's sort of also what Bob what my Russian work was talking about. Edwin, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, and um, I hope someday we have the pleasure, actually, of not meeting on a Zoom call, but in person. 
I, Great. I would love that. I would love that very much as well. And thank you very, Great. very much for taking the time. And stay well, stay safe. And until yeah, you next too. time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you so Bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com slash support.